uh, good afternoon, everyone. I have the pleasure to declare open this public hearing number 11 of our 181 period of sessions. On behalf of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the subject of this public hearings are concerned on the impact of the extractive, extractive industries uh, on human rights and uh, it focuses on climate change in the Caribbean region. I have the honor um, to, to, to serve as the, the second vice president of the commission. And uh, I'd like to congratulate the initiative of a number of civil societies, organizations, diverse, a number, more than a dozen of organizations who took the initiative of raising um, this, this emerging topic and very um, key topic for the contemporary human rights agenda. Um, and I'd like to, to extend also my, my compliments to all civil society organizations and to my colleagues, uh, Commissioner, my sister, Margaret and Macaulay. It's an honor to have you here as a Caribbean voice, women's voice. Um, also, um, Estuardo Halon, Commissioner. It's also a great honor to have you and our dearest um, special rapporteurs for uh, economic, social, and cultural rights, Soledad Garcia Munoz, and for freedom of expression. So uh, the methodology of this hearing will be the following. We will give the floor to civil society organizations for 30 minutes. And then we will have as commissioner, as a commission, we have 30 minutes as well. And then finally, we will have the comments of civil society and the, and the ending of this, this public hearing. So I have the honor to give you the floor for 30 minutes. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Melanie Alain, the founder of Freedom Imaginaries in Jamaica. I am joined by representatives from five Caribbean states. We are honored to part participate in this hearing on the impact of extractive industries on human rights and climate change in the Caribbean. The urgency of this hearing cannot be over-exaggerated. In recent years, there has been an unprecedented expansion in the nature of extraction in the region. This includes the recent launch of Guyana's fossil fuel industry, a surge in oil exploration across the region and an expansion of mining activities on lands traditionally inhabited by indigenous and Afro-descendant communities. The cumulative impact of extraction now presents an existential threat to human rights. Today's testimony provides emblematic cases of impact with a focus on the rights of women, indigenous peoples and rural communities, including fisher folk. This testimony illustrates four common themes of impact that emerge from research in the region. First, extractive industries are fueling environmental degradation and ecocide, which threaten the rights to life, health, and a healthy environment in the Caribbean. The stories of devastation span the entire region. From Guyana, where gold mining is destroying forest cover and severely contaminating rivers from mercury use, to Jamaica, where the bauxite alumina industry is causing dust pollution with resulting respiratory illnesses and effluent spills that result in fish kills and reduced water quality. In Trinidad and Tobago, oil spills are a recurring issue that threatens fisher communities and marine ecology. Second, the environmental degradation caused by extraction threatens a number of other economic, social and cultural rights that are dependent on a healthy environment. Extractive industries are gobbling up prime agricultural lands and destroying water resources. This is undermining food security, disrupting alternative farming economies and threatening already scarce water supplies. The situation for indigenous, Afro-descendant and rural communities is near apocalyptic given their dependency on the environment for their cultural and economic survival. Extraction is systematically dispossessing and displacing these communities whose unique way of life is now under existential threat. Third, 
extractive activities are shaping the climate vulnerability of the region. Fossil fuels in particular are fueling the climate crisis, which threatens the survival of Caribbean islands, given their vulnerability to sea level rise and catastrophic weather events. Extractive industries are also destroying climate resilient livelihoods and undermining food and water security at a time when climate crisis threatens both. Fourth, the negative impacts of extractive industries are exacerbated by neo-colonial governance forms that systematically exclude affected communities from public participation, access to information, and access to remedy. Moreover, governments across the region routinely fail to respect the rights of indigenous and Afro-descendant people to free, prior, and informed consent. The Caribbean experience highlights the racial and gender dimensions of extraction. This experience illustrates how extractive industries disproportionately impact women and girls while relegating former colonies and racialized communities to sacrificial zones of extraction. The exclusion of these communities reflects their broader marginalization in a racial capitalist order defined by sovereign inequality. Within this context, we will start with testimony from a representative from Guyana's indigenous community. Good afternoon. My name is Immaculata Casimiro, and I'm a Wapcha woman from Guyana. Thank you for the opportunity to present an overview of pressing issues my people face. Indigenous peoples inhabit a number of Caribbean territories, including in Guyana, Dominica, Belize, St. Vincent, Jamaica, and Suriname. The experience of the Wapchan people in Guyana is illustrative of the many ways in which extractive industries threaten our rights and our cultural survival as peoples. Indigenous peoples in Guyana face long standing land tenure insecurity. Our inherent rights as indigenous peoples are not respected. So many of our traditional territories, lands, and resources are unrecognized and unprotected by the Guyanese government. National legislation such as the Amerindian Act, which governs indigenous rights, is inadequate and falls extremely short of international human rights standards. Land tenure insecurity leaves us vulnerable to exploitation of our resources by commercial enterprises seeking to do agriculture production, forestry, or mining. In fact, Hundreds of gold mining concessions have already been granted on our Wapchan traditional lands without our consent. Wapchan women are particularly impacted by the lack of land tenure security, as we are the primary providers for our families, working on our farms, gathering materials for crafting and medicines, and caring for our lands and natural resources. Allowing mining on our traditional lands harm our cultural heritage and way of life. For example, a large scale gold mining concession has been granted to foreign and Guyanese companies at Maratau on Marudi Mountain. The mountain, like many others in our territory, has special spiritual value to our people and is also home to important gathering, hunting, and fishing sites. Our women are the main conveyors and protectors of this cultural heritage with unique knowledge about our lands granting concessions and allowing mining activity without our consent threatens our cultural survival. Mining also negatively affects our community's health. Mining practices have polluted our crucial headwaters with mercury. For example, in a village called Parabara, the only access to water is contaminated. Tests conducted in 2018 found that the mercury levels of residents of Parabara were higher than the World Health Organization's recommended level. The women in Parabara have been particularly affected as this mercury poison may be passed from pregnant or breastfeeding women to their children. Additionally, poor mining waste management has led to an increase of malaria and dengue fever in our villages. Mining activities also compound the effects of climate change, resulting in flooding of our farms, which lowers crop yields and increases food insecurity. This in turn has made us more dependent on food from outside our communities. This change in diet harms our traditional ways of eating 
and has contributed to poor health among indigenous women who experience higher levels of chronic diseases, including diabetes and hypertension. Land rights and mining also in affects employment opportunities available to indigenous women. Traditionally, indigenous people live on subsistence economies, but that lifestyle becomes increasingly difficult to maintain when our land rights are not recognized and our lands and natural resources are destroyed and polluted by outside activities like mining. Mining also raises social concerns such as the exploitation of women and sexual assault. Some indigenous women turn to mining as a form of income, accepting jobs as cook and as sex workers, but they often end up exploited and not adequately compensated. Sex work in mining camps is especially dangerous and leaves women in vulnerable situations to increase levels of teenage pregnancies, sexual transmitted infections, and gender-based violence. We are aware of cases of minors sexually assaulting indigenous women and even young girls in our villages. There are no services in our villages to help women and girls who are sexually assaulted or exploited in the mines. And existing reporting mechanisms fail to hold perpetrators accountable. The issues that indigenous women face are intersectional and intertwined with any economic activities on our lands. We are the backbone of our communities. As indigenous peoples, our communities should be granted collective title to our territories and extractive activities were, that were approved without our consent should be halted. As indigenous leaders, women should be consulted in any decision making. We look forward to working with the IACHR in advancing our cause. Thank you for your time and attention. Like Guyana, mining in Jamaica causes illnesses. I am Esther Figueroa, environmental filmmaker. Here's a short video of excerpts showing the impacts of alumina refining and bauxite mining in Jamaica. My first time being affected and diagnosed with asthma is when I was nine to 10 years old. I was in the hospital for about two weeks in 2010, I was admitted 10 times for the pneumonia. We tested for the particulate matters PM10 and PM2.5. The smaller the, the particulate matter, the lower it will go into your lungs, the more respiratory illnesses that it will create for you. The data set clearly established that a higher prevalence of sinusitis, asthma and allergies within a six mile radius of the bauxite company. It's important that at least five kilometer zone should have been, been kept free of as much as possible of pressure from humans. But it seems that, you know, the sighting was done without consideration of, of the communities that live around it. Because what one is dealing with in terms of the process is number one, dust, silica, uh, depending on the quality, iron. There's a huge amount of problem because of NOx, uh, nitrogen oxide. There is an issue with regard to SO2. All these issues are there. Now, why have people in such proximity? And that too, what is surprising is we also have schools in proximity to those, uh, those sites. So you're not only endangering the, the workers and the people who are dependent directly on the fact you are actually threatening those who have nothing to do with the company. And it's, it's about the future generation being impacted. All around where you're looking and you see the mind out here used to be other farmers who used to work in harmony together and it was a beautiful community spirit and area. The act stipulates that the bauxite mineral on your property is owned by the government of Jamaica in bracket the crown and not you the landowner. In essence what they're saying is that they're just gonna come and bump you off the land. Right. This property belongs to the Jarrett Green family bought here years ago from the early 1900s by my grandmother Frances Jarrett and it has been titled and you know up to date with taxes until the present time passed on to my father who died in 1990 and now my brothers and I are the owners of this, this property. To 
since 1972, we're coming on this land. And right now I can't even tell you where I am. And this place, it changes. I don't know where to tell you where is this piece of land. And I used to it anyway. We lost mango, we lost orange, we lost nitsberry, we lost jackfruit, we lost pear, we lost cane, we lost yam. All of those got passion fruit. All those, you can name it. Every look, everything. Yam, I, I, I can banana planting, everything. Come in, it's just like a disaster coming. So them can come in anytime if you say not selling them can come and say, well, I need it. And if you don't agree with what them say, you lose it for free. It was the Garden of Eden. Now it looks like the desert. We lost production. We lost a growing economy. We lost food. We lost water because they're mined on the trees. The economic situation of the community declines in that there's not much for the persons to do because the young men no longer have nothing to do in terms of farming because some used to do it or continue from their great-grandfather. Secondly, you have families being separated and so the whole socio-economic situation shifts. And that's where you find most of the problems because a morning like this you find 10, 20 young men just sitting on the corner doing nothing, absolutely nothing. The whole argument that has been made is that it generates uh, income for the country, it's good. I think one needs to do a serious cost-benefit analysis and actually see who is paying for it and really in economic terms does the country really earn much from all this. Thank you very much for that video, and we will now hear testimony in French, so please turn your channel channels to English or Spanish accordingly. Salut tout le monde. Je suis Samuel Nisner de Haïti, ancien animateur de la collectif Justice Mine. Je suis très content de partager ce panel avec mes collègues car notre situation dans la Caraïbe. Good morning, everyone. I'm Samuel Nesner from Haiti, former animator of the collective She's This Mean. I'm very happy to share this panel with my colleagues um, because of our situation in the Caribbean and is linked to its origin and consequences. This is extractivism, the tool of capitalists and imperialists to destroy the living environment of marginalized people. In the case of Haiti, we want to draw attention to the negative impact of extractive projects such as the free zones and the mining industry. These projects brutally evict peasants from their farmlands and cause serious damage to the already degraded environment. That's why Haiti is the most fragile country in the Caribbean. Therefore, we are going to present four samples of acts of violence directly affecting the Haitian peasantry. After the great earthquake of 2010, under the influence of the US, they proposed extractive projects such as the Caracol Industrial Park, a textile industry which expels peasants on more than 250 hectares of land. From 200 2006 to December 2012, the Haitian state issued more than 52 mining concessions to multinational companies in the far north of the country, including three mining permits. Now there are several mining companies operating on the Haitian territory, but the most powerful are the American companies. These permit permits were issued in flagrant violation of the legal framework. Parliament did not no people in the community were never involved and there has never been an environmental impact study as required by the Haitian mining legislation. In 2014, Joseph Martelli, an immoral musician who, who was appointed president of Haiti by the US government, evicted small farmers from the Northeast on more than 900 hectares of farmland to give Jovenel Moise, the boss of Agitrans under the pretext of producing bananas to be sold in Germany, which has never yet come true. On February 2021, the de facto government of Jovenel Moise undermined the peasants of Jean San Michel de Latne and San Rafael on more than 8,000 hectares of agricultural land to give them to a bourgeois family 
in the country in order to make the production of stevia, the base plant of Coca-Cola. On this land, there was an agricultural farm called SOFA, Solidarity of Haitian Women, which brought together more than 184 Haitian women. All these projects grab the agricultural land, violate the rights of peasants, the right of life to health, and the cultural rights. It is important, therefore, to understand that these are the consequences of these dishonest acts, this violence that make Haiti the most vulnerable, the most impoverished country of the Caribbean. This is a series of criminal acts unacceptable where democracy and respect for human rights reign. These acts must be rigorously condemned in the context of climate justice, it is incoherent to imagine the development of the mining industry, which is a destroyer of water and of the environment. It is evident that it is not possible to imagine the development of the metal industry in Haiti. Haiti has only 27 1,750 kilo, square kilometers with more than 30 million people. So it is impossible to protect the living environment in the face of the threats of damage from these metal mines. On the contrary, Haiti needs to find its freedom to reflect on its self-determination and to develop the family farming alternative tourism as the main economic lever for the sovereignty of the country. Thank you, Samuel, so much. And I'm not sure if you want to continue speaking, you can. You have still have one minute to go. Okay. Didn't allow him to present live, so we will move to the next speaker now. Good day, we are Lisa from Channel Gary Abood, a fisherman and friends of the sea, Trinidad and Tobago. The experience of our fishery folk is emblematic of the ways in which extraction in the Caribbean devastates crucial ecosystems with severe consequences for lives and livelihoods of our rural communities. In Trinidad, like other Caribbean states, this situation is exacerbated by governance without transparency or inclusion. We prepare this video for you to tell our story. The west coast of Trinidad is lined by oil and gas and chemical industries. So the Gulf of Paria receives untold volumes of toxic cocktails, mainly PAHs and heavy metals. It is one of the most biodiverse waters in the Caribbean, indirectly supporting over 50,000 families with 753 registered fishing vessels, representing 46% of all national fishing vessels and providing 70% of our locally consumed seafood. The Gulf is literally the Caribbean nursery for migratory species. When it is poisoned, we are all poisoned. Fish can't live in that. This is a national park, the Chavramas National Park. Every week, every month, the big ships discard their waste oil, wash, clean their bilges. This is what we get. If our fish eat this, they die. If we eat it, we die. Since the 1980s, scientists have stated that the Gulf is contaminated and with hydrocarbons and heavy metals, yet very little is being done. The result is massive fish kills, irreparable damage to our marine food basket, public health risk, and fisher folk livelihoods are destroyed. They cannot work in contaminated waters and entire rural communities become impoverished. I've been fishing here for the last 40 years. Everything is covered with oil right about now. Yeah. We find one shrimp and all this fish. You cannot sell this. This is not good for people to eat. Despite being one of the oldest hydrocarbon producers in the world, only in 2013 was the National Oil Spill Contingency Plan created and without any civil society consultation. It includes provisions for the Institute of Marine Affairs to maintain a fingerprinting database to identify responsible parties and for possible prosecution. However, after eight years, such database has not even been started. The result, an average of two reported oil spills weekly, yet there have been no fines, no punishment, no penalties imposed on those responsible for literally hundreds of oil spills. Generally, these spills are a result of poor maintenance, sometimes intentional discard, 
simply because it is cheaper to dump than to contain or recycle. This that I'm seeing here, it's a complete sea. It's a porridge of, of, of crude oil. And this is very dangerous for our health, for all of our communities that eat fish, for our fishers. This environmental degradation, socioeconomic collapse, and increasing human health risks are pluming in a shroud of secrecy without transparency or inclusion. Our government's Auditor General has repeatedly stated in his annual report that there is no independent verification of production volumes submitted. We don't know the correct volume. So apologies for that disruption in the video. Um, we will proceed to our, our next presentation until we can get the video back up. My name, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Janet Volcan. I am Guyanese. The shocking spoliation of the biodiversity around Trinidad and Tobago, which you have just seen bits it now extends to Gaia's speed of fossil fuel extraction in the Caribbean Sea in the context of our climates, our region's climate vulnerability. This expansion is worsening the climate emergency. In May of 2015, ExxonMobil announced the find of 2 billion barrels of oil equivalent, 200 kilometers offshore in Guyana's exclusive economic zone. By 2021, ExxonMobil's estimate for the Stabrook tract alone had quintupled to 10 billion barrels. The feverish race to explore for and pump more and more oil in deep waters is taking place with minimal oversight from Guyana's regulatory agencies. This is very high risk for the environment and for resource dependent human populations. This expansion in the Caribbean presents an existential threat to the rights of present and future generations to life, health, and a healthy environment, particularly through its proven link to climate heating. 89% of Guyana's population live on the coastline, which lies two meters below sea level. Guyanese, particularly women, indigenous and fishery dependent communities and individuals living in poverty are already experiencing the negative effects of a warming and degraded ocean and rising sea levels. Fish catches of both the artisanal and industrial fleets of Guyana are now at record lows. Climate change also impacts economic, social, and cultural rights, including by undermining food and water security in the region. 41% of Guyana's population was classified in 2017 as living below the poverty line of 550 US per day. Consequently, they have a high dependency on a resilient natural economy for subsistence. This poorly monitored offshore fossil fuel industry is incompatible with our constitutional rights to a healthy environment, and moreover is in breach of Guyana's international obligations. The threat of oil spills is also an urgent issue for the people of the Eastern Caribbean islands who, would, who live in the direct path of any offshore oil spill. This, the the um, current offshore exploration and production is 200 miles offshore, but closer to the Caribbean countries. Marine and coastal environment and life are being degraded by continuous discharge into the sea of heated water and the flaring of associated gas from the FPSOs. Despite community resistance, Guyana is pushing through with an extremely dangerous undertaking by excluding the public from access to information, decision-making, and access to remedy and environmental matters. We respectfully ask you, commissioners, to call upon Caribbean states to stop activities that aggravate the climate crisis such as any further risky fossil fuel exploration in deep water, which threatens the effective enjoyment of human rights. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Craig Murray. I'm a volunteer firefighter 
an island of, in, in the northern Bahamas. You heard earlier about the climate crisis and the, the catastrophic hurricanes we've been experiencing in the Caribbean. I'd like to tell you what the hurricanes mean for the communities on the ground. For us, it's a matter of life and death. In 2019, I was totally traumatized when I watched the most destructive monster of a hurricane, Hurricane Dorian Angle from Abaco and um, Grand Bahama. This category five hurricane ripped through this island, taking lives, livestock, wealth, and precious memories. Going through the storm was horrific, but the after effect wasting it. Dorian causes billions of dollars worth of damages, including the island's infrastructure, causeways, airports, ship ports, electricity, and water mains. Home churches, schools, and businesses were also damaged or totally destroyed. The landscape looked helpless. The loss of life was traumatic. I helped to search for families and friends. I did the painful task of extracting the body from the wreckage. We have reports of over 70 persons whose bodies were recovered. However, the real figure could be much higher since many are all gone for and missing. Vulnerable communities such as people living in poverty and, and, and migrants were particularly impacted. For example, two informal sediments called the mud and the pigeon peas were completely flattened. These sediments were once home to the Bahamas' biggest Haitian community, and now nothing remains. Some Haitians evacuated, but others were killed. It's hard to say how many died. Many people were also displaced. The government built white domes as temporary shelter for the homeless residents. Tell this day, families still live in these structures. This is one of many faces of climate displaced in the region. Hurricane Dorian exposed the iniquity that exists between and within countries. The poor and less fortunate are the ones who suffered most. Dorian and his devastation will impact on minds for generations to come. In light of the urgency of extraction and the testimony you heard today, we ask the commission to consider the requests in our written submission. And I see that we're out of time, so I will just highlight a few here. We respectfully request that the commission reaffirm the right to a healthy environment as an autonomous right and use the commission's working tools to protect that right, including through the precautionary measures mechanism. Develop and promote standards with respect to the rights of peasants and rural communities. And call on Caribbean states to stop activities that aggravate the climate crisis, comply with the state obligation of prevention of environmental harm, comply with the obligations to recognize, protect and respect the communal land rights of indigenous and Afro-descendant communities, and take specific measures to guarantee access to information ensure public participation in environmental decision-making processes and provide accessible and effective mechanisms to achieve environmental justice. Thank you. Um, thank, you thank you very, very much. First of all, I want to apologize. I connected a few minutes late, um, so I wasn't at the beginning. Thank you, um, Vice President Flavia Piovesan. Um, secondly, I really want to congratulate the presentation you've done. It's uh, I, I'm really impacted of, of the presentation you have done. All the information, the videos, I mean, it's not the same just to, to listen to the testimonies, but to see the reality through the video. So really, um, I'm very impacted with, with all the situations in different countries of the Caribbean. So congratulations for that. I'm going to, to give the floor to my fellow commissioners, starting with um, Second Vice President Flavia Piovesan, in case she has any questions for you or any observations. Flavia? Thank you so much, Madam President. Uh, first of all, I'd like to endorse your congratulations, uh, expressing uh, gratitude and recognition for such an urgent, important and key topic in the contemporary agenda, human rights agenda, uh, through this extremely well-worked structure, consistent, robust uh, presentation. Uh, so for us, for the commission, it is really a very important moment to get closer to the Caribbean realities, and especially to have this overview, this, this holistic view concerning uh, the situation of Jamaica, Guyana, Bar Bahamas, Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago, 
uh, providing such valuable information and um, the, the case studies of all those uh, realities from the human rights based approach to environmental issues and to climate change. So um, it's a, a really an important and I'd like to highlight one, highlight once again um, uh, this really this so crucial initiative. I'd like to raise three questions. Um, the first question has to do with the state legal duties. Uh, I, I took note of almost everything and especially at the end, the first request to the commission was to, if I understood well, um, to give an environmental rights, um, the level of an autonomous human rights. And I'm happy to say that according to the Inter-American Standards and the Inter-American Jurisprudence of the court, recently, I'd say, in the um, advisory opinion 23, as well as a leading case, which was decided last year against Argentina, Pueblo Nuestra Tierra against Argentina, the court for the first time addressed this issue. And for the, the Inter-American Court, uh, environmental rights are human rights and demand from the state uh, preventive measures, access to information, accountability, impact assessment, um, and also international cooperation. So we have a number of principles which were uh, highlighted in this advisory opinion and in this recent case. So um, I'm glad to say that. But in the case of Caribbean um, and concerning um, the topic of this public hearing, the impact of this activity industry on human rights and climate change, I'd like to understand state measures. As I could understand, nothing happened. It's just like the, my, my conclusion is that there is just impunity, not um, preventive measures, no due diligence. Um, so I'd like to understand uh, the big picture uh, better in terms of um, if you could clarify the level of preventive measures and how the states are dealing with the legal duty to investigate, punish, and redress human rights violations. And also the legal framework, um, I'd be, um, I'm very curious and uh, for the commission to be very important to know. Uh, my second, question has to do with the violation of the prior and free and informed consultation. As understood in all the case studies here presented, uh, there is this lack, the violation of the prior free and informed consultation uh, concerning uh, people who were affected by uh, the impact of those industries. So I'd like also to, to have this source of information about how uh, Caribbean countries are respecting from the state perspective, this respecting this, this very important right. And also the issue of impact assessment, assessment of the risk of the human rights violations. And finally, my third um, thought has to do with climate change because we had um, uh, last Tuesday, I suppose, last, last Last Tuesday, we had a whole session dedicated to states. So we have, we um, commissioners, we were dialoguing with a group of four, uh, four groups of states representatives. And for the Caribbean states, climate change is really uh, an emerging and a key topic. So I'd like to hear from you, civil society, how uh, you see that, how you see the climate change from the rights-based rights based approach. So thank you so much, Madam President. And thank you all for such a wonderful, although so tragic and dramatic, but very uh, wonderful public hearing. Very, I feel very touched and impact as well. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bilvesan. Um, uh, Commissioner Margaret May McCauley. Um, thank you, Madam President, and good to see you. 
Um, I'm very happy to see Melanie, it's very, this fantastic presentation which you presented on behalf of the Caribbean CARICOM countries and um, which is absolutely superb and could not have made the situation clearer. Um, it is, I think, that the first time that the commission has received such detailed, specific, concise and clear information about this, the subject matter of, of this, this um, session that we're having together, uh, which is the impact of extractive industries on human rights and climate change in the Caribbean. And um, I, it was clear to me, and, and I, I hope you can confirm that my clarity is correct, that there is indeed by and large a complete lack of prior information and prior consultation before the majority, if not all, these extractive industries commence. That is that the governments of these states enter into contracts with the corporations without prior information to the peoples who reside um, in the lands, on the lands or by the seas uh, and, and they do not engage in prior consultation with them. They do not inform them of any impact studies which have been done, if any at all. And so the persons are left completely unprotected and bemused and lose their lands and their ways of life and endanger their health and survival. Um, that I, I got that clearly. And um, it, is it possible, I want to do this so that I do not forget. Is it possible for you to provide us with a copy of this presentation and give us your permission to use, use it or parts of it in any meetings we may have with any of these states on the matter? And also, do you intend to request um, um, precautionary measures from the commission? And um, if so, would it cover all the areas of the Caribbean which are adversely affected by extractive industries? And and in a very in whatever particulars is relevant to each state. And also in relation to climate change and the effects it's having on the um, Caribbean countries, can you say at this time, what exactly is being done in these countries? about climate change, even though the, the, the peoples who reside there and the poor population, the general normal population have a very faint uh, um, impact. Um, can you say what the governments are doing, especially those who have entered into contracts for extractive industry within their borders or around their borders and in the lands of their peoples. And then would you be more specific in what we can do immediately as a commission? And I think one of the things which has to be done is that I am a Caribbean and I am aware of um, um, resident and I'm aware of lots of 
stuff that go, has gone on in Jamaica, but even I am shocked at the breadth and depth of the destruction and impact that this is having in this small region with a relatively small population compared to say Latin America or Central America even. So we need, this has to be publicized as widely as possible. We have to push for impactful action and commitments from the state and monitor, monitor those uh, um, actions which the state must take. So I know that you all will assist us. I saw many names of persons who I know, Esther and so on, on this long list of, of committed uh, um, um, civil society groups and NGOs and human rights defenders. So I know you would work with us in partnership in this matter. And it is long overdue that we do have this kind of partnership with you all in the Caribbean. Thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner McCauley. Um, co um, Commissioner Rallon. Thank you very much, Madam President. I would like to greet my colleagues and all the representatives from the organizations. It's great to see you, also my, our special rapporteurs. I would like to comment on some issues as quickly as possible so we can all use the floor, in particular, our ESCE rapporteur, who will probably have a lot to say because of the issue. First of all, I would like to join my colleagues in congratulating you on your presentation. I was shocked to see some of the images, in particular, those with regards to the pollution in several bodies of water that affect fishermen. The videos, the images were very concerning. And you have all of our solidarity for that fight in order to um, point out the situation that is affecting basic human rights in terms of water, of health, things that are so important. My second comment is that I am the rapporteur for several countries of the Caribbean. I am the rapporteur for Trinidad, for St. Lucia, for Suriname, for Haiti. And of course, I'm at your disposal to follow up on this issue, should we happen to need a um, working meeting, for example, with the rapporteurship for Trinidad, so that we can even uh, think of a roadmap where we can provide support as a commission. So I'm at your disposal here. I would also like to say that the commission is very much aware of the climate change challenge. We are working through the ESEE rights um, rapporteurship on a declaration on uh, climate change in order to start, to start visibilizing this issue. And there are several reports that have been launched through Redesca, such as the report on human rights and private companies, which is very important for accountability in uh, doing private business in terms of respecting human rights. I also think that the relevance of this case, and this is just an idea for my colleagues, but I think that regardless of whatever might be said about this hearing on the um, press release, we might launch with the information from that presentation that Commissioner my colleague has requested and any other pieces of information you can send, we will be assessing that. And there might be, and it might be necessary to launch a specific press release about the impact of this issue on the Caribbean. It might be useful using these resources to launch a specific press uh, release, considering that the all of the information you have presented um, is about situations in many, many countries, so we can have a comprehensive vision of we will probably be able to assess this within the commission. And basically, those are my comments. I also have a question. 
have there uh, is there any process contesting the operations you have mentioned on your presentation in any of the countries because of these violations has there been any sort of judicial measure um, those are my comments thank you I will now uh, give the floor to the special rapporteurs. First of all, um, Soledad Garcia, a rapporteur for, for economic, social, and cultural and environmental rights. Thank you very much, Madam President. Good afternoon, everyone. Very welcome that possible press release, Commissioner Estuardo. As economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights rapporteur, this hearing is very important. I will say historic. And I also want to congratulate your presentation very much. It was really extraordinary. From now on, I want us to be very close after this hearing, following up on the important information and requests that you make to us. And the fight against climate change is a top priority for Revesta, for my, 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 my office in, in the commission. And we are working on new standards for the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on Climate Change and Human Rights. And hopefully a thematic report soon with a special focus on the Caribbean. I will encourage you to keep our report on, on business, companies, and human rights, as the, the Commissioner Estuardo uh, remember. It is about inter-American standard, and I think it's an important tool for your work. And uh, about your request, uh, yes, the Commission, like, like the Inter-American Court, affirmed the right to a healthy environment as an autonomous, indivisible, and interdependent right with all the other human rights that you have so well highlighted, water, health, food, housing, cultural rights, etc. And And well, after these preliminary remarks, I would like to ask you some specific questions. First, it did, is there progress in your countries to ratify the protocol of San Salvador and the protocol of Escazú as they are so important tool in, in these matters? In second place, I would like to say, in, in what way is the pandemic impacting this situation? And the third question is, if there are cases before the national courts about this situation, and if they could reach the Inter-American Commission at some point. As, as you mentioned, the different mechanisms of the commission and of course from my mandate, we are really, really interested in, in, in impulse, the, the Inter-American climate justice. And finally, if, uh, if you are going uh, to participate at the COP26 and if do you have some concrete goal there? Thank you very much again, and I hope, I really hope to be in touch with all of you. Bye-bye. Um, thank you, Soledad. Um, I don't know whether the Repertoire for Freedom of Expression would like to take the floor, Pedro Vaca. Thank you, Madam President. It, it's an honor to be here with our authorities and leaders, Commissioner Atreu Rejola, Fabio Pibesan, Margaret May Macaulay, and Esparto Rallo, and my colleagues at the Executive Secretariat and the Special Rapporteur for Social, Economic, and Environmental Rights, Soledad Garcia. Oh, oh. First of all, I would like to congratulate this outstanding presentation, the way that civil society organized and shaped such a complex, a complex topic in the assigned time, it's a matter to highlight. When we think about humanity challenges overlapped with human rights warranties, climate change and its impact on human rights is a clearly high priority, a top priority. And a significant part of dealing with this challenge through a human rights oriented perspective implies access to information and transparency. The Special Rapporteurship for Freedom of Expression recently published a guide on access to environmental information in the context of extractive industries. And I highly encourage all the stakeholders to use this inter-American tool worked by the office I lead in coordination with the Commission and the Special Rapporteur for Environmental Rights. And in that path goes my question, and is, which is your evaluation around the availability of public information on the issues you raised during this public hearing. Thanks, Madam President. 
Um, thank you, Pedro. Um, before I give you back the floor, um, I would also like to ask a few, a few questions. Um, I would like to hear your opinion regarding the role of uh, multilateral organizations such as the Inter-American Development Bank on the situations you have exposed today, if you see they should have a role in, in this and if, if you know if there's any work that has been going on with some states with the, the multilateral organizations or with the private enterprises. I think it's very important to engage these organizations too, and I don't have much information, maybe you do, if there's any work being made in the Caribbean countries relating to the matters that you have exposed here today. Secondly, um, regarding the situation of human rights defenders, um, you have, you, you have um, told us a lot about um, the, the impacts of extractive industries and also the impacts of climate change and, and human um, mobility. But I, do, I would like to have more information about the situation of human rights defenders that, you know, that have to oppose to a lot of these um, in extractive industries. And if, if like other countries in the region, they are being threatened or criminalized some information regarding that situation specifically uh, would be really important. Um, and then, um, if you know of any of 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 any um, private enterprises that have been working with communities regarding, for example, um, um, uh, I, I don't I don't remember the name in English. I will say it in Spanish. So turn turn to, to turn to, to the to interpreters. It's um, Acuerdos de Impactos y Beneficios. Experiencia sobre el Acuerdos de Impactos y Beneficios. Si the um, experiences on impacts and benefits. If you know any private companies in the Caribbean that are already working with the communities in participation, because it is one thing um, to have a previous consultation, as you have pointed out, but I would like to know if there are any examples of good practices by private enterprises or even the state institutions in order to achieve agreements of impact and benefits with enterprises, as well as uh, complaint mechanisms within the companies as a preemptive measure, so as not to reach uh, the peak when there's a point of no return. So have, do you know about any um, Good practices examples, you have pointed out a very critical situation in the region, but it would be important to know if there are any good practices examples in the region, whether from the private or the public sector. Thank you very much. And now I will hmm? give the floor. How long? Oh, I think it's, yes, you have, another 30 minutes to make your presentations, to answer our questions, and maybe to present any other topics that uh, you may have missed during your first. Yeah, I think Commissioner Urrejola is frozen. So as the first, as the second vice president, I would, I would suggest to give the floor to the civil society organizations um, for 30 minutes so we can get even more precise information. Thank you so much and congratulations for your remarkable work. Thank you very much commissioners for your comments and for facilitating this hearing. I'd like to give the floor to Immaculata Casimera from Guyana, representing the indigenous community there, to speak about the question that you had regarding free, prior, and informed consent. Okay. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, thank you for your question. Um, <clears throat> um, as it relates to your question, um, I'm going to speak about what happens in my in my territory. Um, well, first of all, that the large um, company that had applied for the mining license um, on Marudi Mountain—that's the the topic that I I talked about earlier. 
it, the co communities within that area have never been properly consulted. Um, there was once um, a meeting uh, where they only circulated a questionnaire and um, which we as Wapchan people didn't consider a consultation. And um, what, what is happening is that so many times um, because of this, um, most of these concessions are issued on our traditional land. And we are not consulted. Sometimes it's on our, our title, our title of our border um, of our title lands. So this is something that has been happening and something we have been calling upon um, all governmental agencies, all, um, all other persons coming to, to have um, these kind of developmental activities on our lands that they must first consult with us as a people because we have, we see the land as different to how other people see it and, and we use it differently because we depend on it as um, for our livelihoods. So this is something very important to us as the Wapchan people. And I think all indigenous people in Guyana, um, because across Guyana, I think um, they have similar issues um, that indigenous peoples face. And yes, it's very important to us. Um, thank you. Thank you, Immaculata. And I, I believe we have a response from Trinidad and Tobago now on the question of legal and preventive measures. Thank, thank you, Malini, and thank you to the commissioners for allowing us. Um, it's a very interesting question because the, 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 the issue I want to drive home is that we are talking about countries, some of whom only have 65,000 people and maintain a parliament, a fire service, uh, investigative police department. So economies of scale act against us, whereas the extractors benefit from a global footprint where they can afford all of the luxuries of intellectual capital, services, guidance, legal advice, etc. So in terms of level of preventive measures, certainly, and I, I mean this without any offense to Belize or any other country in the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago, because of World Bank um, conditionalities back in the 1980s, evolved with legislation for environmental management, which is first world in, in its standards. But the legislation requires synchronization with Guyana, Suriname, Venezuela, Grenada, all of the region have commonalities of water, air, so we need to have regulations that respect and, and coordinate those commonalities, and that doesn't exist. Secondly, even though some of us do have some type of regulation, Guyana in particular, it does not allow or meaningfully allow any type of consultation, inclusion, any mechanism for total transparency. There is some transparency, up until you ask a question. In other words, the environmental impact assessment is not mandatory. And if it is required by the government, it may or may not allow a single window of consultation where you can go to a meeting and you as a layman would not be provided with any mandatory interpretation of scientific data, but you have to use your own common sense to understand all of the technical scientific terminology and graphs and studies of which we are handicapped. So there's no mandatory translation capacity of the EIA in the public consultation. And then there's no requirement in law that your comment is noted or written down, recorded or responded to. They can simply say, thank you for your question. We will think about it. And it's the, it's the end of the story. So in terms of each nation, with our handicap of not being able to afford all of the required technical professionals to review the, the EIA. You, the fact remains that there's political interference. Oftentimes, the review officers who have to review the EIA are not given full-time employment in the government. They only have contract employment, such as in Trinidad. And you can lose your job if you are too objectionable. 
So oftentimes in our instance, we very sadly have to report to you, we've been to the high court all the way to the Privy Council in several instances and over 30 times, because it's very difficult to get the system to work. So we have splintered, and I, and I really mean that, splintered legislation, often as a requirement of a EU World Bank or IMF conditionality that often is not interpreted, enforced, or connected to the other institutions and the, without the required regulations to make it a homogenous or a workable system. I hope I haven't been too long. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. I'd like to now play an audio recording from Samuel Nesna from Haiti. He's an anti-mining activist in Haiti, and he was trying to connect, but the connectivity there is a little difficult, but it's important for us that everyone has access and is able to participate in this hearing. So I will now play his audio recording. If there are any challenges hearing it, please just indicate and I'll try to fix it. Merci à toute l'équipe et à CIDH qui font un travail extraordinaire et merci encore de nous écouter. Alors, tout d'abord, pour la question de consultation, et je vais ajouter quelques éléments. D'abord, la consultation devrait être un élément obligatoire I would like to add some questions. The questions, the consultation should be compulsory for all the decision making processes that imply the life of the community and even more important, in order to create a consultation within the community. People who are living in that community need to be to have the right to be consulted so as to make a decision and that decision needs to be respected later on because it is a legitimate consultation i would also like to thank you for this opportunity the second question or thing that i would like to add is about decision making in the case of extractive companies or industries mainly talking about peasants, they are threatened by the mining industry or extractive industries of any kind. And I think it should be a priority. Decision making should be a priority as well as, I mean, cooperation, the legitimate, the legitimate consultation that that will give way to life decisions for them. We cannot make a decision without having their opinion, without having the opinion of those people who are concerned and involved in it. I would also like to add that within the political crisis that we are currently having in the country, there is an agreement, there is a political agreement that proposes or suggests solutions that are very important for Haiti and that joins great participation of political parties and organizations. But now under the influence of the US and the large economic groups, the authorities of the state reject it. They do not accept, they do not accept making the necessary decisions or taking the necessary measures in order to apply that agreement. The authorities are telling us, the authorities are telling us that they cannot do anything else and they know that they are that we are undergoing very difficult situations i believe that the commission might add this element which is something very important thanks for listening to me samuel tu peux ajouter quelque chose samuel would you like to add anything else trying to connect so i will now hand over to janet vulcan from guyana who will build on this theme of, you know, the issue of consultation and legal measures at the domestic level. 
Thank you, Maleni, and good afternoon again, commissioners. I wanted to reinforce the point made by Gary and fishermen and friends of the sea that the Caribbean Sea is interconnected. And so the risk, high risk uh, uh, petroleum exploration and, and production poses a risk not just to the people of Guyana and Suriname, but to the entire Caribbean. So I went to a hearing, a public hearing last night, which ExxonMobil had in Georgetown. And they added up, they mentioned there the number of wells. These are very deep wells at the depth of 18,000 feet, uh, 200 kilometers offshore of Georgetown. So this is within the uh, exclusive economic zone, but very close to the other Caribbean countries. Now this is under the, the, the it's about 5,000 feet of water. And then deep, the depths beyond that to go to 18,000 feet in hard rock, is twice as much as the deep the uh, deep water horizon blowout with Macondo in 2010. ExxonMobil, which is the operator, in other words, Guyana, you're the owner, but we are the operator. They have at the moment they're planning for the Liza Phase One and Two, 50 wells. These are deep wells. Then they're moving to Payara, which will have an additional 95 wells. Adding on, last night we learned that Yellowtail will have 67 wells. Let's imagine these wells are all drilled in a, this area, um, in one part of the Starbrook block, block alone, one operator, that those are 162 wells. So the question one, someone in the audience asked, can you tell me about your spill response plan? What will you do if there is a spill? And the answer is, we, are we have been doing simulations. We've been doing simulations there are about 15 Guyanese who are involved, the CDC, the Guyana CDC. If we see a teaspoon of oil in the water, we try to investigate it. And um, we have a local content policy. Um, we have a, in Guyana, we have booms and we have dispersants. Commissioners, this is very high risk. In other words, we did not hear last night that there was any marshalling by ExxonMobil, no evidence for controlling or stopping a spill in waters as deep as this is. And I would like to suggest that this is, puts the entire Caribbean at risk. Uh, one commissioner asked about legislation. So in Guyana, the 1986 Petroleum Act is still the act in force, 1986. There have been three or four attempts to revise this act, I think, IDB with some IDB financial support and technical support. These um, attempts have gone nowhere now, up to now. Why? I suspect it's because successive governments in Guyana want to maintain ministerial control, which is against best international practice. Consequently, what's the situation in Guyana? Here I've just mentioned 160 something or whatever wells in deep water think deep water horizon. And we have not had, we have no independent commission, no commencement order to um, activate the natural resources fund. And everything is done by the executive arm of government. Now the problem with that as well is that executive arm of government, there are ministers, we've never been seen a mandate letter. So no one knows which minister has what in their portfolio. So there's no um, freedom, no prepared informed consent, nothing in the portfolio. What does, so what's available to the population? That was asked. The one tool that's been available has been the Environmental Protection Act because the, there is a, a, um, the companies which want to do this, these drillings have to apply for environmental authorization. Over the last six to eight months or the last year, uh, these have been routinely waived. The necessity for, and, and, uh, for EIAs, environmental impact assessments, have been waived. And citizens, community groups, and individuals have written letters within a stipulated 30 days only to write a letter. You have to see this uh, thing only published in one newspaper, any one newspaper that we have waived it. Citizens have 28 days to issue a letter. So that's been the one mechanism to protest and citizens groups have done it and have appeared before the EAB, the Environmental Assessment Board. 
And so I point, I, I think again, I'd like commit the commissioners to re reflect on the very high risk behavior that's, that's ongoing. Now, 200 kilometers offshore is far from Guyanese eyes. ISIS, I would like commissioners to, to bear in mind just before the meeting in Glasgow that Guyana and Suriname are sending a joint delegation at which they will say, look, we need to be able to explore more and pump more oil in order to get the money to address the climate crisis and fulfill our nationally determined contributions. My opinion, this is a very high risk strategy. It imperils the lives and livelihoods of all our Caribbean people. As Gary said, we are small populations. We have to value what we have, la vida digna. We have to value that beyond what ExxonMobil and other corporate actors want because they don't live here. They do not live in the Caribbean, they live elsewhere. And they can go back to clean, intact places to retire to. We have the Caribbean, we must protect it. And I would wish, I hope commissioners can send a message before COP26 in Glasgow. Thank you. Thanks so much, Janet. Um, that important perspective from Guyana. I'd like to hand over now to Esther to give an, a perspective from Jamaica, after which I will give a like a global overview of state duties and or the you know lack of compliance with obligations. Esther? And Esther, could you unmute your microphone? Thanks for the opportunity. And um, thanks again, commissioners, for your very supportive reactions and for your um, suggestions. We will work very, very closely with you going forward to, to supply you with all the additional information you need. And we would love to cooperate with you very much. I would just like to briefly talk about the aluminum industry in Jamaica, which duplicates and reduplicates much of what has already been said about Ghana, Trinidad and Tobago, et cetera, et cetera, throughout the Caribbean. One thing to keep in mind when thinking of legal frameworks and governance is that the government of any of these states has all the incentive to extract. In other words, we keep talking about foreign entities, whether Mobile, Exxon, et cetera. But for example, in Jamaica, the government is a majority owner in many of the businesses that extract alumina and bauxite. So the government has all the incentive to continue extraction. One thing to realize in terms of the legal framework is that Alumina, the aluminum industry in Jamaica began under colonial war powers in 1942 in Jamaica when Britain was in charge. The vested act, the acts that rule mining in Jamaica come from 1947. They vest all ownership of minerals in the government. That means that you as a property owner do not actually own the land that you own or occupy. The government can give leases, permits, whatever it wants, and you have two weeks. The company doing the extraction only needs to give you two weeks notice to come onto your land. So the, the laws are extremely powerful, not just that, they grant a single minister, a single individual, the right to make agreement to overrule any technocratic or other decisions, a single individual in the government. And this has happened in Jamaica frequently. So the legal framework is such that gives the government extreme ownership and power over the rights of citizens to own property, to live where they want, to have mobility, to choose their work, et cetera, et cetera, those sorts of human rights. Within that, the kind of things that have been talked about in terms of the EIA process, for example, in Jamaica, it's a complete charade. The EIA is done 
and paid for by the entity that is going to extract. So it is in the interest of the results, the entities, the environmental professionals who are hired, simply say what those that are paying them to say, want them to say, which is extraction has to happen. I do not want to go on further because I don't want to take up more time, but I just want to reiterate that the system is corrupt and overpowerful. And it, it, it is for the benefit of the government, but not the citizens and the residents. Thank you. Thanks so much, Esther. And in, in the eight minutes we have left, I'd just like to give a global perspective on this question of state compliance with obligations. And then I'll hand over again for individual you know, case studies of what this looks like in individual countries. So starting with the constitutional level, I think the structural issue is that there are only two states in the Caribbean, for example, that recognize the right to a healthy environment. And when it comes to economic, social, and cultural rights, you know, there aren't many states that actually recognize those rights. And even if they're recognized, they're not implemented. So when we talk about extraction and its impact on the environment and related economic, social, and cultural rights, we are dealing with a structural issue related to the lack of constitutional recognition of these rights um, at the constitutional level. But moving on from the constitutional level to the regulatory level, the environmental impact assessment process is the framework in which communities can participate and, and, and regulators can promote the protection of the environment in, you know, environmental, in, in development matters. However, a study of environmental impact assessment processes in 14 Caribbean states showed that they were largely, you know, they fell well below the standards of environmental impact assessments. So only two states, for example, had a robust environmental impact assessment processes for example, um, Belize and Trinidad and Tobago, for example. But even then, those frameworks are not being implemented on the ground. And you know, there are structural issues regarding the process. So for example, in Jamaica, as in other state, states, the legislation provides for you know, this process to be implement, implemented through regulations, yet those regulations have not been implemented. And so there's a huge gap with respect to carrying out those processes. So, you know, with that context in mind, I will hand over to, to Trinidad and Tobago and to just emphasize that what we're dealing with is a structural and a regional issue that is, you know, regional in scale, structural in nature, and, you know, it manifests in different Caribbean territories. So Lisa from Trinidad and Tobago, I hand over to you. Good afternoon again, everyone. And again, thank you, uh, commissioners, for your strong support in this matter. Um, just simply to point out that we have several laws in Trinidad, as Melanie mentioned, we have these robust environmental laws, but Trinidad is one of the few Caribbean countries that we actually have a judicial review act. So we are allowed to challenge the decisions of a government or any public authority. But even though we have this act, it sometimes is very lengthy and very expensive. So our civil societies ourselves to go before the court to challenge their decision. For example, ever for us, one of the very few and um, NGOs that have gone before the court and even South without any kind of sponsorship, we would not be able to do this. And we also have a Freedom and Information Act, which allows the public to get any information from government institutions. But there again, there are many clauses. For example, we cannot see the contracts that oil industries sign with our government. We have laws protecting this. So that's what we call the serious contract trans, um, secrecy in Trinidad. So we don't even know what our royalty rates are in Trinidad. And, of, and we also mentioned in our video, we have something called the National Oil Spill Contingency Plan. Now we only got this plan 2013. And even though having a hundred years extraction, it was only recently been implemented. But this particular plan has no force of law. So therefore it's not really mandatory for, for the, the policy measures put in place. It's not mandatory for all of these extractors and oil companies to follow. So yes, we have a plan, but it's not a hazard force of law, nor it's mandatory. And again, we have very robust environmental laws and it builds um, environmental management authority, which the, authority, um, the authorities in charge of protecting our environment. But it also depends on the independence from the state, in state and public and political pressures. 
and it's questionable their independence. So we have a lot of examples where CECs are rubber stamps, CECs and certificate environmental clearances, which you need an application, which you need a permit for to do any kind of oil and gas activity or quarry activity. But many of these applications are rubber stamped and many do not go through our robust CEC process and our laws. So a lot of it don't even have public consultations. For example, I like, for example, there were 161 CCs approved for seismic surveys in the past 20 years. Only of these six applications, only two were conducting, C, were, were conducting seismic surveys and only those two had public consultation and an EIA. The other 159 seismic surveys, there were no EIAs done because EIAs are all again on the discretion of the EMA to make sure and have these oil companies, have it been conducted by these oil companies. And it's not, it's not part of our legal process, sadly. And another thing as well, we have an EITI in our locally. Um, EITI is the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. We have our own local arm and in that. Again, without, there's no EITI legislation. So therefore, even it's good to have a society-led body in Trinidad and Tobago watching out for making sure in increasing transparency in the forest sector and the oil and gas sector. But with all that EIG legislation, any information put forward by our oil and gas and forest sectors are all voluntary. So it's not mandatory for them to provide this information to the public. And lastly, um, closing up with regards to our quarry sectors in turn that, that we have many regulatory frameworks and which requires that a lot of quarry operators to have mining license, but our, out of our 131 quarries, only nine have valid license and the government is fully aware of this and they don't even clamp down on these illegal quarries. And for the last past four years, we mentioned in our video, we had 498 oil spills. Again, even though we have many legislation and laws put in place to charge those who are responsible for these oil spills to be charged and fined, no one has been charged for these oil spills, both on land and on marine waters. Thank you again, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Lisa. And I see we have one minute and 40 seconds remaining. So before I hand over to, to others in the group, I would just like to say quickly in response to your question on what action can be taken right now, I welcome the idea of a, a press release specific to the Caribbean highlighting the urgency of the issue of extraction and calling on Caribbean states to address this issue. I would also add to that the possibility of doing a, a more comprehensive report, for example, a follow up to the 2016 report on the impact of extractive industries to incorporate the information we've presented here, as well as information you can you know, get from perhaps a site visit to the Caribbean. And I would also finally say, you know, a joint, some type of joint process with the United Nations to, to address this issue. So in the last 50 seconds, I'd like to give Kirk Murray from the Bahamas an opportunity to speak since he hasn't been able to respond to any questions. Uh, during, 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 you know, people were displacing and shelters and stuff like that. During, during, I, I think that the, the Bahamas and the Caribbean Islands need to put in place more structures of training for people during the crisis and climate change because they don't really know what's going on. Dorian costs, uh, I'd say $51.3 million, um, a decrease in salaries for people in private sectors and stuff that 88% 80, of total loss were suffered by pr private sectors when working for people and stuff that. So if, if the Caribbean could come together um, and train people more like some island price, uh, you have other NGOs that came law for the Samaritan Praise Water Mission, Red Cross, can come back and train, like how Samaritan Praise had a training for Abaco, specifically the, the community members that I, I joined, and I did training that we could train our community members about climate change and how we how can it better foster, you know, to help each other in the Caribbean and other, all around the world. Thank you very much. Well, once again, thank you very, very much for all this presentation, all the information. I think this has been a public hearing that is very, very important uh, for, for the commission. And of course, I hope for you too. And I hope that after this, we can 
um, start a kind of a roadmap with the different organizations that are present here, and also with the states from where you come. I think it's very important we can do a roadmap on these issues. Um, I think it has been a really, really good um, hearing, and I, that is thanks to you because, um, again, like all my colleagues have said, it's outstanding the way you you've presented the information. It's it's much more clear for us to get a sense of the reality, even though um, we have been monitoring the situation. But it has been very important to to see the, the reality through the videos and to listen to all of you. So, really, thank you very much. We have taken notes of your requirements and I'm sure we will be able to do a future meeting and to do a follow up on these issues and I hope we can work together because um, the, the matters you have presented today are very serious and we want to do an agenda on these situations, especially focused on the Caribbean countries. So um, thank you very much and I hope we can meet soon again. Thank you and take care. Bye-bye.